Please continue to enjoy your lunch while we begin our lunchtime program. The first part of the program is going to be a conversation between our chairman, Mr. Lawrence Geller, and one of the members of the International Churchill Society's Board of Trustees and one of our longtime supporters, Mr. Chris Matthews. Gentlemen. Ah. Lawrence, thank you. For, uh, for those of you who are in the room who've uh, never heard of Chris Matthews, you're in the wrong place. Um, and we're very lucky to persuade Chris to even talk because he's so shy. Uh, I won't go through the introduction, but I I've got a couple of things I just want to say. One, that Chris was a presidential speechwriter during the Carter administration, forgive him, and later worked for six years as chief of, chief of staff to Speaker uh, Chip O'Neill and uh, saw history being made with the Reagan administration first on. Importantly, he's an acclaimed historian and author of eight best-selling books. Um, there is one thing, though, that really irritates me, that he's a lifelong Philadelphia Phillies fan, which he claims is part of his soul. Well, I would say that means, as a Cubbies fan, I can tell you, he doesn't have a soul, and I forgive him. <laughs> so you're forgiven for that, Chris. Um, You've been a, 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 a wonderful Churchillian, you really have, and I, and I say that not lightly. Uh, what drew you to him in the first place? Uh, personal um, courage, the willingness to uh, stand alone against uh, all the forces in his party or in the other party or in public opinion. He just, uh, I think the first sign of that was when he took his, uh, his uh, nanny, his womany, as he called her, uh, to Harrow and walked up and down the high street, not caring what his uh, fellows thought of that, that he would express his love for his nanny in the face of uh, the kind of crap you take in high school. And uh, that told me this guy had, was a comer. And uh, he talked about a tree that stands alone uh, and bad weather is the one that lasts. And his father was not a warm figure, Randolph. And he um, took that. I just like the fact that he was ready in 1939 uh, and 40 to be Churchill, that he spent his life preparing himself to be the man who stood alone. And I think he, will al he always said 1940 was hard to beat because that was before the Russians, uh, the, the, the Nazis went after the Russians and were before we came in the war and it was he all alone. But he really spent his life all alone. And I, I just totally respect that. And what's, what do you dislike about him most? Well, nothing really. <laughs> um, well, you would, I promise you won't get lynched. Well, you I, might. I, um, to be honest with you, nothing comes to mind. I'm not a, I'm not a stupid critic looking for things uh, that aren't important. I, I thought, uh, of course, you could say when he, when he championed Edward VIII and was sort of a vainglorious effort to have a monarchist party, come on. He was just screwing around with the, with the Tories on that one. We all know what he was doing. He wasn't going to be able to get that marriage accepted. And, um, yeah, but, you know, fly, uh, you know, fly in the ointment. It didn't bother me. <laughs> I guess India, you could say, but he was an imperialist. And um, that's how he brought out, came up, and uh, he wanted to keep the empire together. By the way, congratulations on picking a place to meet, which was... It's reminiscent of when we were all one big country, right? <laughs> <laughs> this, was, <laughs> this was British territory the last time they had a big meeting here. Uh, this was, um, Lawrence, the country of your birth and your country of your choice, all meeting here. It's perfect, the, the beauty of this. Uh, uh, last time we were here for, for a big occasion was, was Reagan, and um, we had the G7 here. That was a fantastic time to be here. And I hope it looks better now. It, well, because it's under better management. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. Uh, how would you compare? How would you compare Churchill today to the U.S. leadership and other world leaders? How, how does it? How well, I was just reading this fabulous book. Is Andrew here? Andrew Roberts. This book. Is he here? This book is. I've read my. Uh, I have shelves and shelves of Churchill. In fact, when I first came back from the Peace Corps, I went to the Library of Congress and I found all the shelves down in the stacks there, 
all this church at it. But this line, it's on page um, 99. The first time you meet Winston, you see all his faults. And the rest of your life, you spend in discovering his virtues. What a great, I mean, that's better than anything's ever been said about anybody. And um, it does remind me, I'll tell you what I think about Trump. Um, on a good day, a very good day. Uh, there, there, my wife hates to hear this. Uh, there is a Gatsby quality to the guy. Uh, the guy who, you're not sure how he made his money. You wonder if it was done the right way, but you know he made a lot and he made it fast. And you, uh, and you like, there's some charm to the guy when you meet him. I always thought so. And I do root for him to straighten out. I do, I root for him to straighten out and tell all the overeducated critics of his they're not so smart after all, but he, he, he does let me down in ways that make no sense at all, I'm making fun of African-American women, calling them stupid. What, what, look, what's that about? I mean, what is that about? And, uh, but I do, do see he has this political brain that's probably sharper than any of his opponents. His ability to read the public, maybe the worst way, but he reads them. He knew how to read those industrial states last time. He knows how to hear. He tweets back and forth in a way that's sort of been an interactive thing he's doing, which no other politician I've ever seen could do this. A back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it's like a nightclub comic who stands in front of a brick wall and knows what material works and uses it again and again and again and, and doesn't use what doesn't work. And so he has his favorites. But he has so much talent uh, for that sh political showbiz that I hate to see it wasted on stupid arguments with journalists and uh, and put down, so this, this uh, woman, Mia Love, who lost the race in Utah, a Mormon convert uh, who got beaten, and he said, oh, Mia Love, didn't get much love from her, have a nice day, Mia. I mean, a little magnanimity. Remember Churchill, yeah? Churchill said, Mag may be magnanimous in victory. Well, he won, they were all gone, his opponent, those Republicans who didn't stick with him. But I think magnanimity is really important in politics, and, as then, he's, he wins the brains battle. He may run again. I think his health doesn't look too good. Uh, it doesn't look good at all sometimes. I think, I don't know if he's running again. I guess he is. But we're in a titanic struggle here between he and Robert Mueller. It's a titanic struggle over, if he indicts his family members, I don't know what's coming, constitutionally. I don't know what's coming. Right, well, you didn't answer the question, Chris, but I guess Well, what was the answer? <laughs> He's not Winston Churchill. <laughs> uh, who's the closest to Churchill amongst all the world's leaders, then? Well, the most impressive is Angela Merkel. Uh, she's a, a star. Um, you have these cute people coming along. They're cute. I don't think they're great. Uh, you know, Justin Trudeau and... and Macron, um, uh, Theresa May's not great. I don't think Corbyn's good at all on the other side. Um, I guess I guess I'd say Merkel is really a star, and, and because she's been a kind of a CEO woman, she has that new paradigm of leadership in the world. Be the CEO, be the smart, smart business person. She comes out of East Germany too. It's an astounding career if you think about it. Um, I think Nikki Haley in the United States is the one I'm watching. I uh, when she, um, I think you have to grab, as a friend of mine says, the galloping horse of history rides by, you better get on that horse, because it's riding by. You have to get on a horse as it passes, or else you've lost your chance. And when she pulled down the Confederate flag in South uh, Carolina and had Lindsey Graham go along with her, and the other big Republicans all went along with her, but she led and when someone said the other day that she was, had gotten confused, and she very directly and abruptly said, I don't get confused. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's guts. And I think that was a sign. I don't know what she's planning because she left the administration right before this loss this week. Did she know the loss was coming? Is she setting up herself? Who knows to do in, uh, in 2020? But I tell you, if there's an opening, she'll grab it, I think. Look out, Mike Pence. I think if she went against Mike Pence, and maybe the first woman president will be a Republican, because that would make sense. Because it would more, it'd be more like the John Wayne model than the collegial model. 
It'd be more like that, more like Thatcher. I think she's got it, and I don't think a lot of other people do. Okay, well, the question I, I've, I've been pondering about is that about campaigns today, it, it seems to me from watching television that they seem about more about firing up sympathetic groups and getting them to vote, and, and the parties are polarizing in extreme ways. Does anybody care about changing minds of voters or wavering voters anymore? Is that those days gone? Well, the people on the, I'm center left, uh, people on the left of me love moderate Republicans. They do now. They love moderate Republicans now. They just don't like moderate Democrats. <laughs> so they like the other side to concede. <laughs> they, they like the other side to give in. Uh, they're not too thrilled about their side conceding. And that seems to be the way it is right now. Uh, we've lost the Northeast uh, Republican. We've pretty much lost the Mid Midwestern Republican. If you look at the map as a war map, like in World War II, when you look about the closing lines of the two sides, it's astounding to realize that we have really no, we have one Republican, actually one New England Republican senator now, Collins. And we have one other, actually there's only two others, there's Portman in Ohio and Toomey in Pennsylvania. That's about it. And, the, and all the Northeast, the upper right-hand corner of the country. And the Midwest is pretty much that way too. In this election, the Midwest swept against Trump. Of course, the Northeast, the suburbs against Trump. And the, and the Republican Party now is the party of people who didn't go to college, which is so ironic. And the Democratic Party is the elite party of those who did finish college, which is so ironic. The working man's party is not the working man's party anymore. The working people in this country, have tended, as a majority of them, they go Republican now. And that's in all the polls, which is ironic. The South is, no, is a solid South now for the Republican Party, not the Democratic Party. And, and the Western Plains states, the, the Rockies are, are Republican largely. The left coast is the left coast. The East Coast is left, moderate left. The country's really balkanized, you're right. And I don't know who's gonna come along and, uh, but just think Washington was a Federalist from Virginia. So he was able to pull the country, be the ironic, exceptional Federalist from down here who could unite with the, uh, with the uh, better off people up, the landowners up in the Northeast, and they were able to put together the Federalist Party. But uh, I don't see any surprises in our politics today. I can't think of one moderate or really moderate Democrat. I can't think of any really, the only successful Republican moderates today have all left. Flake is going, Corker's very impressive guy. He left, I don't know why he left, he was good. Lindsey has flipped, who being just a Trumpite. Uh, t uh, Ryan Costello split, uh, Charlie Dent split. They all make a lot of noise on their way out the door. And that's not courageous. It's helpful to listen to it, I guess. We have this guy, Dave, Dave something rather. As my wife pointed out, he's like the all occasion angry Republican against Trump who shows up, Dave Jolly, he shows up everywhere now. Yeah, I don't know who's paying his ticket, but he's everywhere. <laughs> Wherever there's a TV show, he's on attacking Trump and everybody says, here's a Republican to attack Trump. All right, Chris, in 1974, you stood for Congress. Pennsylvania, what year? Pen 1974. Yeah. You were. I got eight. a lot of votes. You were eight. Uh, you got 24% of the vote. I got more votes than Cor uh, Ocasio Cortez got. <laughs> Unfortunately, my opponent was part of their political machine in Philadelphia. He got a lot more, but. Okay. Flip forward. You're standing again today. Thank God you didn't. But you were, let's assume you did. What would you do differently? Well, how would you run a campaign today? Well, um, I think you have to have a, a value added. You said a few minutes ago that these parties simply accumulate their constituent groups. Uh, I'll start with the Republican side, evangelicals, uh, uh, business people that really want the lower taxes, but they really have nothing in common with each other <laughs> because the business guys tend to be very secular and the evangelicals aren't making any money, but you know, they find they agree. Um, you put those coalitions together, the pro-life pro people, you put them in, the Catholics from the industrial states who vote very pro-life. People don't pay attention to this, but they vote on that issue. That's why the working class in this country is split pretty much in half because of the life issue. Democrats won't admit it, but people in Pennsylvania are very concerned about the life issue. That's why the senator up there, Bobby Casey, is pro-life. Uh, the uh, 
The Democratic Party is the usual. I went to a Mondale event back in 1984, and I sat at this big, it was in the Hilton in Washington, and I watched Mondale give his speech, and he's not a bad guy, he's just classic, okay? He's classic. He would say something for labor, and a bunch of guys would stand up at four or five tables and go up. He'd say something good about Israel, four or five tables would stand up. Say something about teachers, and what he would say about teachers was, I believe in giving teachers all the resources they need and getting out of the way. Okay, I get it. All, they want more money and no competency standards, right? That's what the teachers want. He said he gave them exactly what he pandered to every table, every table, but not once did he say anything that the whole room stood up for. That's a problem. So what would you do? You have to say something that the whole room believes in and cares about. Now Clinton, Bill Clinton, I make no case for him on many grounds, which you can figure what they are. I make no case for him. But he was a good politician. And he would say things like, I'm for people to work hard and play by the rules. Boy, did that work with the working class. They said, damn it, he's talking about us. I'm putting in 50 hours a day. I'm making hardly any money. I'm paying my taxes. I'm a chump. But I play by the rules. I don't cheat on my taxes. I show up for work. I take my orders. I take the boss's guff, and I come home, and I have a beer, and I live with it. That guy, that woman, the waitress out there, he goes, he cares about me, the person who works hard and plays by the rules. They also said the Catholics, like me, moderate Catholics, they'd say, I'm for making abortion safe, legal, and rare. Boy, that worked. Whether it was Hillary's BS or whatever it was, it worked with me. Bill Clinton knew how to do that. Hillary Clinton did not know how to do that because she didn't want to do it. Bill Clinton was for NAFTA. She was not for NAFTA. He was really, because I was in Japan with him last year or two years ago, and I watched him say what a great program TPP was. He, right in the room with me. I called up his guy about it. He said, well, that was off the record. I said, no, it wasn't. He's for TPP, and now they're all disowning it. Disowning NAFTA, TPP, all free trade. Okay, the Republican Party's no better on trade now, thanks to Trump. But, you know, I thought Bill Clinton had it figured out. He knew how to get people who were social conservatives like me and... Uh, on, on some issues, and he knew how to talk to me, and he also knew how to talk to, um, to working people and the pride they get in work. Somebody said the other day, your American citizenship's just a piece of paper. Put that in your pocket and don't say that again. Don't ever say your American citizenship is just a piece of paper. You know, and uh, they don't get it. The Americans soul some of these people. They don't get it, and uh, on both sides. And I think we have a soul as a country, and we want to be talked to that way. Working pride and work, and uh, and some morality. All right, Chris, you've got a room here of diverse, a diverse group. Oh, of really people. diverse? I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Wildly diverse, all the way from uh, let's see, A would, to B. Assume that would be the case. <laughs> <laughs> There may be an odd Republican scattered but around. But you and I were, were you were at, and I were out in Bohemian Grove. You saw a lot of diversity out there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, really great. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that. Okay, what's the unifying subject? Forget the, assume this is diverse. What one unifying subject could coalesce America? Well, you know, I think Trump, in his own way, was trying to get at, but he didn't really want to go the right way. You know, uh, I think nationalism is a terrible word because of its history. But patriotism is a great word. And I think people do have a, they, this country, this place we're in right now is part of our treasure trove of our history. Our history really matters to us. And, and you know, we, I had an African-American woman calling us the country of slavery, and I go, oh, no. We're the country that lost 600,000 white guys fighting the end slavery. And don't tell me that that wasn't part of our history, too. It's all part of our history. And I think one thing that Brits do really well is they, they commemorate everything. Bloody Mary's at Westminster Abbey. She's there. Henry's there. They're all there. You know, maybe parts of them are there, but they're there. <laughs> and, and they don't hide from their past. And I love that about our country. I love it when you just say, yeah, this is all part of it. Yeah, yeah we came here. We, sh a lot. Yeah, we shot a lot of Indians. Yeah, we had slavery. And yet, you know what? We've been trying to get better all the time. And I think that... Uh, I think that Americanism, patriotism about our history is really important. And I don't think uh, kids get any history now. And I think uh, people our age, most people are my age, I guess, uh, who really do grow up with history. And uh, I read the landmark books growing up, you know, the Monitor and the Merrimack, you know, Winter at Valley Forge. We, we grew up with that stuff. And uh, I think it unites us. 
And I think there are a lot of times these fights over whether it's Obamacare here, there. You know, I think if you get away from the ideology and the Bernie stuff, it's about practicality, like pre-existing conditions. And we can work those things out. And we have to have an immigration policy we're proud of. I just say don't run for Congress unless you believe in enforcing the law you passed. That's all I ask. Whatever it is, enforce it. So figure out something you believe in, X many thousand people a year from across the border, X many people we let stay over, over there, or we agree to let them have longer stays on their uh, visas, whatever, but make it something we're proud to enforce. And uh, I think it's doable. I think it's doable. I know health care is fixable because Trump and the Republicans want to fix it. Two days ago, Mitch McConnell said the fight's over. I think they can fix that one. I want to change subject. Uh, this weekend, 11th day, 11th hour, 11th month. President Trump, Trump is uh, in Europe joining a group of more than 60 world leaders in France. They're commemorating the 100th anniversary, the end of World War I. That was a clash of violent nationalist passions. There's a rising tide of nationalism in Europe today and a US president who terms himself a nationalist pulls out of international treaties. After the war, you had 1990 and 20, the US Senate rejected signing the Treaty of Versailles and didn't join the League of Nations. It was unable, the League was unable to act. Couldn't check ambitions of Japan, Italy, or Germany. Okay, you're a historian and one of the nation's foremost and strangely most prescient political commentators. What does all this mean for the future and what's the end result of all of this? Well, there'll be a synthesis when it's over. Trump went through the protectionist route. I mean, our hero quit the Tories in the early part of last, the last century over protectionism. He went over to, let, to the liberals on that issue alone. Uh, I think that uh, we were trying, and we have been trying through NAFTA and TPP and GATT and everything else to try to find a world order with business so that there are laws that uh, countries like China will obey, including on intellectual property, they'll actually obey the law. That's the way you have trade. You need law to trade. You need law. And, and I think that's what we have to figure out a way to do it. And I think, the, uh, I think that uh, playing the nasty boy is not being a truly nationalist. I mean, I think our national interest lies in, in trade. And um, it has been uh, pretty enlightened since the uh, Taft, not since Taft, but since the 30s, when we learned that that didn't work. Texasism didn't work. So I think we can argue about it, but I think it's going to be some sort of modified free trade down the road and uh, some sort of modification. But tr Trump is bullying. You know, Churchill talked about John Foster Dulles as the only bull he knew that carried his china shop around with him. <laughs> and, and, and this is who we had right now. He's our guy. He's our president. And uh, that's what he does. He brings the china shop with him. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate, I, 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 the funny thing about me and my job is I don't hate Trump. I've known him 20 years. I've always been, to some extent, to some extent charmed by him with, him with when I'm with him. He thinks I really like him. He is a little <laughs> bit of a Sally Field personality. He wants us to like him. He's about eight years old <laughs> in his sort of sensibility, about eight years old, in a tough neighborhood, somewhere in Queens. Queens. And he's angry at the kids in New York, and, and he, he feels a little bit insecure, and he fights with everybody. He's, got a, he's sort of a John McEnroe fighting with the umpire all the time. And we'll see if that works another four years or another two years. I don't know. Uh, I don't know who can beat him. So, But I do think that the, 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 the world situation like we're watching this week and the, the way we went into Europe in the teens of the last century then pulled out was a disaster. The fact that we went in and tilted the war, when the Doughboys went in there and carried the war against uh, the Kaiser and won that war because they went in it and really shaped the future of Europe because they went in it and then left the shaping of Europe. It was the horror story. And letting magnanimity disappear completely and allow the little, the little corporal to come to power because of all that anger in Germany about the way they were, dis they were basically uh, pummeled after the war a war they lost on a margin. They didn't get the trounced, they were lost their war on a margin. And, uh, and I think we know what happened. 
going in and then pulling out is probably the worst thing to do. We better know when we go in what we're doing. And uh, I think we're part of the world. I think absolutely Trump is all, off base on this, that we're going to be part of NATO. NATO was wonderful. It was unbelievably successful. And uh, if you were there when the Berlin Wall came down and saw what happened and, and realized what, what how it wasn't just Reagan, it was everything with Truman forward, that they did, just, they did it just right. They waited for the bad system to fail. And I think that uh, we got to be that enlightened for the next 50 years, I think. Thank you. Chris, let's assume you were chief of staff today to Churchill, a, Ch a Churchill. How would you advise him to handle Trump? Oh, God. <laughs> Trump, right now, has to decide which road he takes from now to really the beginning of the next election, which is the beginning of 2020. He'll win the nomination. He will win probably 40% of the country right now, no matter what he does wrong. So he knows that. He'll get that, that block of votes, and he'll get that block of electoral votes, and he'll get nominated. I don't think John Kasich could beat him or anyone else, so I don't think they're going to try, really. They might try, but they won't really try. They won't go for everything. So he will have that. Does he want to be reelected and be a successful two-term president? I think he's got to make the same course correction that all presidents have done. Uh, Bill Clinton did, he signed the welfare bill, he did all kinds of things, he got rid of Carville, he got rid of George Stephanopoulos and all those people that were losing for him and he, he changed his action and he won re-election. Uh, successful presidents listen, he should listen. I think he did hear, he didn't like the sound of it but he heard it. He's gotta change his policy and he could do it in quick order on health care. Put that fight behind you, you're not gonna win on the pre-existing conditions and kids having their health care through 26. That's very, very popular in this country. The, the fight's over, get it over with, with women especially. Women are not gonna vote for a guy that doesn't understand that. Uh, a lot aren't. Any, and secondly, I think he can cut a deal on infrastructure and start rebuilding the country. He promised to build. It's a great inch on landing with the labor unions. He could go right up to construction trades. Maybe not the teachers and the civil uh, employees, but he can get the construction trades who are pretty much de dead right now and get them on his side by a real rebuilding program starting, at, uh, starting with Penn Station all the way to LAX Airport. I mean, he could do it. Let's face it, de the deficit isn't a political issue right now. He could do that with a capital budget. I'd do that with a capital budget. I'd, I'd still, bar the interest rates are still doable. I'd do that, and then I'd try to do something on the border. I'd say, okay, we have to have a border, we have to have a policy, you're not gonna get the wall. Well, maybe he can't deal on that one, I don't know, but I think he should try. I don't wanna have the same stupid arguments two years from now, six years from now, 20 years from now. I'm afraid these guys, because the Democrats like the issue too. They think they're gonna get all the Hispanic vote. Well, they're never gonna get all the Hispanic vote, they might get two thirds. The Hispanic vote is, the more middle class those people become as they come into the country and become Americans and, and have opportunities here, they're, they're becoming more Republican. They don't have the same values as the Democratic Party on social things, on moral issues. So I think he, he, could, uh, he could change history if he could cut some deals. So I'd say deal. You say you're the art of the deal, prove it. That would be my chief of staff advice. Okay, so now you're chief of staff to Churchill and you're gonna deal with Trump. What's your advice as a, to a chief of staff to a foreign leader? Oh God, well they've tried to, be not, to nestle up to him. I think uh, Justin's tried. I know his ambassador, I think they will keep trying because they did, they did, they're done, right? We have a North, a North American trade deal with a new name, US Mac or something it's yeah. called. <laughs> anyway, they, got, they changed the name of NAFTA. <laughs> um, um, I'd be Merkel, I'd just be tough. I'd be Nikki Haley. This guy doesn't respect anything else. I'd be tough. I don't think you want to be, uh, you don't want to have your tail wagging like uh, Lindsey, Lindsey Graham. That's embarrassing for everybody. I mean, we're all embarrassed by Lindsey Graham. I'm embarrassed by him. I, I think toughness, Nikki Haley is my role model right now. Be tough, you don't stick it to him, just show you're as tough as he is. Mitch, Mitch Landrieu, by the way, watch him, the mayor of uh, New Orleans has got the same kind of toughness. I mean, why, he stood up to Trump at the uh, gridiron dinner this year. And even Trump looked at this guy and said, this guy's tough. He's making fun of me and he's doing it in my face and he looks strong. 
He comes from that tough family down in uh, Louisiana. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for people like that. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed going through Hurricane Katrina with Mitch. Uh, he was a strong guy. He really was. He Better than your guy Nagy or whatever his name is. Oh, man, I just The guy you put in your 28th floor. I just wanted floor. him to go to jail. He never, he, paid his, he never paid his room. No, not a penny. <laughs> He, he put him up during Katrina on the 28th floor of a Marriott on Canal Street, and he never paid for his room. <laughs> yeah, well, Noah, I, I'm so old, I sold Noah the wood he hadn't paid me. <laughs> All right, last question, Chris. You're a keen student of history, so let's discuss a few names, and I want to tell, tell me who was the best and who was the worst. Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, Oh, man. Reagan, two Bushes, Clinton, Carter, Obama, and your buddy Trump. Well, that's an absurd. <laughs> Look, of course, I'm I think, absurd. I think Roosevelt, Roosevelt was uh, uh, uniquely confident. I was just talking to someone before today, uh, earlier an hour ago, about how sometimes having a, a doting mother works. <laughs> and uh, Sarah gave him the self confidence that nobody's ever had. And, and I think being able to walk up on that podium at the Capitol in 1933 in March and assume responsibility for the Great Depression with absolute personal confidence to say we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, that's inside you. That's not a speechwriter. And uh, I think since Lincoln we've been, what, what a streak we had though. You just gave us a, a streak of presidents just think about Roosevelt's gone. Nobody, my dad was born in 20. He told me he didn't re remember any other president. Yeah. And it was when 45 came. He, it, he'd grown up with one president, and all of a sudden he's gone. And uh, Truman comes out of Missouri as sort of a hick, a haberdasher, a failed haberdasher. And he did a great job. He had wonderful instinct, and he, and he, uh, he did things that you can't think about. They're so horrible, but he had to do the bomb. He did the Berlin airlift. I mean, he did it. And he stood up to, to uh, Stalin in, uh, with the Truman Doctrine. And uh, he did it all. And the Marshall Plan. I mean, how many presidents pull that stuff off? And he did it all. And then Eisenhower turned out to be a damn good president. He goes up, by the way, he's number five now in the polling I'm looking at. He just keeps rising. And everybody thought, oh, he was kind of dull and pretty smart guy. And by the way, we all got here on his highway. <laughs> 95 was one of his. So, I mean, we would be going through county roads and speed traps and little <laughs> sheriffs waiting for us. Thank God we've got a 75 mile an hour Autobahn coming down here. And he got the idea from the Autobahn. He got the idea from the, from the Germans, the, the, the fast superhighway with no exits, just keep going and high speed and straight. And then Kennedy was great. I'm a Kennedy fan. I think Jack Kennedy uh, saved us in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He put the man on the moon. He had big ideas. He was basically a conservative. Teddy, cons uh, his brother, was a liberal. But, and Bobby was in transition. You weren't never sure where. Uh, a great president. Reagan had the instinct to know that Gorbachev was different. He, I'm not sure even George Sr., who I like, would have been instinctive enough to know, God, this Gorby is a commie, but, you know, He's different than all these Molotov m robots that I've been dealing with all my life. He's not a robot. He's a recognizable human being. And, and I think he saw that instinctively. I think Nancy saw it, his wife. And they put together the end of the Cold War in a way that was really good for us. And, uh, you know, I was standing on the corner of 17, maybe 17 to Penn, when Gorbachev came by, when he made one of his visits for one of the summits, and I jumped up and down. Because this is the, you know, we grew up, most of us here, are hiding under our school desks. You know, the nuns gave you 15 minutes and said it's going to be a flash of light. It'll be the end of the world, the general judgment, get ready. And we did it about every week. <laughs> and kept our religion and our politics and our civil education all together. <laughs> we all knew. And when you grow up like that, you'd really like a guy who ended it. So I'm for that. Uh, and Reagan did that. Trump... Uh, is what he is. He's not smarmy. He he's, doesn't have the bad stuff most politicians do. He doesn't pretend to be somebody he's not. He is what he is. It's all out there, starting at four in the morning. <laughs> it is it is Sally Field. I hope you like me. I, I it's that sad, but it's that true. He wants us to like him. Uh, you know, 
It's going to be a hell of a race. I don't know any Democrat that can beat him right now uh, unless he blows it himself. I do think his health is something he's got to pay. If anybody's friends with him around here, tell him to lay off the hamburgers and, and get it so he can actually button his coat. <laughs> I, I think he's got, if he buttons his coat, he get reelected. I mean, he's got a, he's got a, a big tie and the big thing and all the big statement about his physical prowess. He's got to go. He's got to, got to get in shape. Chris Matthews, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And if uh, Andrew Roberts has joined us, Chris does not want to leave without getting that book signed. <laughs> we look forward to hearing more from Chris this evening during the gala banquet, but right now we've got a few words again from our executive director, Mr. Michael Bishop. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm just briefly going to don my other hat as director of the National Churchill Library and Center at the George Washington University. Less than two weeks ago, we marked the second anniversary of the opening of the NCLC. In the years since we last gathered in New York, the library has further evolved into a vital hub of Churchillian activity, where Churchill's life and career are explored and illuminated, and his matchless example of leadership is held up as a guide for policymakers and future leaders. I am grateful to Geneva Henry, Dean of Libraries and Academic Innovation at GW, for her continued support, and I'm happy that she's with us today. We even welcomed, thank you. We even welcomed Churchill himself, Gary Oldman, and director Joe Wright for a tour and reception on the eve of Darkest Hour's release. Last semester, the NCLC was the venue for an undergraduate research seminar on Churchill's life and times, taught by Professor Dane Kennedy of the History Department and myself. Enrollment was restricted and many were turned away, and thus the students in the class were enthusiastic and determined. Throughout the semester, the students engaged in vigorous discussion and debate and wrote admirably balanced papers on a host of complex topics. We have also strengthened our partnership with the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy a worldwide organization with thousands of members, hosting discussions with them on Brexit, British politics, and even a presentation on how to write like Churchill. Through these activities, we continue to discharge our duty to keep the Churchillian flame burning for this and future generations. Our already impressive exhibits and displays have been enhanced by the addition of a massive bust of Churchill cast directly from the famed statue by Ivor Roberts Jones in Parliament Square and loaned by Lawrence Geller, and here joined by three presidents of the George Washington University. More recently, we were the happy beneficiaries of an extended loan by the Sheila and Wayne Knight Family Trust of San Antonio of treasures including a distant view of Venice, painted by Churchill in 1935. And I would like to thank Jack Churchill for the loan of the flag that flew over the Capitol as Churchill delivered his address to a joint meeting of Congress on the 26th of December, 1941. Thus, do visitors to the NCLC have the opportunity to explore the many faceted life and career of Winston Churchill. In the midst of all this activity, our Churchill conversations proceed apace. Since we gathered in New York a year ago, we have welcomed to the NCLC an impressive array of leaders from many fields of endeavor. Just a partial list includes journalist Robert Costa, best-selling novelist Robert Harris on Munich, MPs Sir Alan Duncan and Jesse Norman, historian Neil Ferguson, philanthropist David Rubenstein, and Israeli ambassador Ron Dermer. Just last Monday, we welcomed Andrew Roberts for the U.S. launch of Churchill, Walking with Destiny, before a sold-out crowd. 
Many of these events have been filmed by C-SPAN and are available on C-SPAN's website. Almost all of them are available on our website, on YouTube, or on social media. For as Churchill told us, the longer you can look back, the farther you can look forward. More than perhaps any other historical figure, Churchill's life and career offer lessons and insights about the problems and challenges that face us today. Thank you very much. That was the report from Washington, and now with the report from Fulton, Missouri, the director of America's National Churchill Museum, Mr. Tim Riley. Thank you, David, and thank you, Michael, for that great report from our nation's capital. Uh, the International Churchill Society is comprised uh, of so many wonderful Churchillians, uh, but two great leading organizations, and that's the library at the George Washington University and the National Churchill Museum, America's National Churchill Museum at Westminster College at Fulton. And I think what uh, it's built in the program as a view from Fulton, I'm gonna give you a glimpse. Uh, there's been a lot going on. Uh, I'm happy to report uh, that the attendance in Fulton has skyrocketed in the past year. We've seen a 27% increase in visitorship, 27%. Uh, people ask why, and part of it is due to the great popularity of the film, Darkest Hour. Uh, part of it is due to the fact that I think our country and our nation is looking for leadership. In fact, almost every day in the galleries of the National Churchill Museum, I'm asked, why don't we have more leaders like Churchill? Well, that's the reason the museum exists. We inform and we inspire. Uh, and the fact that our visitorship is up, I think, is testament uh, to the interest and growing uh, interest in Winston Churchill. We had a record fundraising year last year uh, at the museum, keeping uh, our, our lights on, uh, we're going from strength to strength, as uh, Lawrence Geller said earlier. Uh, we've seen an increase in membership, uh, and we've even seen a, a great realized bequest to our endowment. So our financial position in Fulton is strong, uh, it can be stronger, and we strive to be good stewards of those of you who invested in our cause, in our museum. But most excitingly, in Fulton, in the spirit of what Michael just said about looking back and looking forward to the past, we're looking back to 1969, next year. Next year, 2019, will mark our 50th anniversary of the rehallowing of the Christopher Wren Church of St. Mary the Virgin Aldenmary, which was located uh, in London, built by the British, Christopher Wren, bombed by the Germans in the Luftwaffe in 1940, and rebuilt by Americans as America's National Churchill Museum in 1969. And we're going to celebrate and commemorate that anniversary on May 3rd, 4th, and 5th of 2019. So please all mark your calendars, May 3, 4, and 5. We'll be having uh, our Churchill Fellows Weekend and a terrific Jubilee celebration. So I hope and invite Hope you can all be there and invite all of you to join us. We are taking an approach in planning the weekend very much like our predecessors did 50 years ago. When the idea to establish a national Churchill Memorial in the middle of America where Churchill gave his Iron Curtain speech uh, came to be, um, President Kennedy, Chris Matthews and Chairman Geller mentioned the presidents. Uh, many of the ones they talked about uh, had a hand in building Fulton. Kennedy was our chairman for this effort until he was assassinated in 1963. Lyndon Johnson picked up the mantle and said, I will be the chairman of the Fulton Project if and only if Truman and Eisenhower join me. So we have had presidential support and I'm very happy to please, we're building an honorary committee for our 50th anniversary that includes the grandson of President Truman, grandchildren of the Eisenhowers, uh, and the daughter uh, of President Nixon, uh, all of whom have lent their support uh, to our cause and will help us celebrate on May 3, 4, and 5 next year. So I invite you all to join us to come visit the site of the Iron Curtain speech, where Churchill famously said, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent, and experience 
the wonders of Churchill, his life, and his legacy at America's Churchill Museum at Westminster College. Thank you. Oh. I also want to leave you with, there's one more slide I'd like to leave you with, with uh, a minute long here. Um, we're also engaging our local community. We have a very strong emphasis on letting the next generation know about Churchill. And of course, the term special relationship that we use every day was coined in the Fulton speech by Churchill on March 5th, 1946. So I'd like to introduce you to something we're doing with the youth of Missouri called the Special Relationship Project. Next slide, please. Two words, special relationship. How would you depict that concept on a six by six inch canvas? The National Churchill Museum at Westminster College, together with every school district in Callaway County, Missouri, is planning a community-wide art project to explore the idea. When Winston Churchill delivered his historic address at Westminster College on March 5, 1946, he coined the phrase, special relationship, referring to the alliance between Great Britain and the United States. For Churchill, alliances were critically important. The great statesman Fulton speech, now known as the Iron Curtain speech, was given the title, Sinews of Peace by Churchill. Sinews are tissues or tendons or things that bind muscle and bone together. They make us stronger. So do alliances and special relationships. As part of its 50th anniversary celebration in 2019, the National Churchill Museum is inviting all K through 12 public and private schools from the mid-Missouri area to paint or draw this concept of special relationship. Some will choose to explore the relationship between parent and child, some between community and commerce, still others, the relationships we have with our neighbors, pets, churches, schools, or civic organizations. These relationships are sinews making us a stronger society. Together with brief artist statements, the compiled artworks, over 5,000 in total, will be photographed, numbered, and documented digitally for global distribution via custom mobile applications. The works will then be installed and exhibited in a grand mosaic of special relationships in the National Churchill Museum to open on March 5th, 2019, the anniversary of the Sinews of Peace speech. The National Churchill Museum at Westminster College invites you to join us for this extraordinary project, the Special Relationship Project. Our final presentation for the lunch program is going to be a view from Chartwell with the lovely Catherine Carter. Ladies and gentlemen, Churchill famously once said that a day away from Chartwell is a day wasted. And whilst it is a great pleasure to be here with all of you today, and as the person who gets to help look after this very special place, I can certainly see why he said it. My name is Catherine Carter, and I am the very fortunate person to be project curator and collections manager at Sir Winston's Country Home in England, which is now in the care of the National Trust. Chartwell was Churchill's home for over 40 years, and as many of you will know, it was vital to his political, and his literary output. Countless speeches, books, articles, and correspondences were written in those very walls. But it was also a place of great enjoyment for him and was where he could indulge in his favorite hobbies and pastimes. In 2016, 50 years after opening to the public, we began to fundraise for our Churchill's Chartwell project, which seeks to reinvigorate the legacy of our nation's greatest statesman and give the collection at Chartwell greater resonance in the 21st century. In doing so, we will inspire a new generation to engage with Churchill's history, his love of Chartwell, and how he continues to impact on our lives today. Alongside acquiring a large number of items which have historically been on long-term loan to Chartwell, 
visitors will see a number of changes in the coming months and years. For example, we are opening new rooms to the public which have never before been seen. And they include Sarah's bedroom and the secretary's office. And by sharing these new spaces, we can tell the stories of the family, friends and staff who created a whole community around Chartwell, all of whom were vital to Sir Winston's well-being and work. We are also improving how we tell the stories of the collection at Chartwell, adapting to the sadly diminishing numbers of visitors who remember Sir Winston's war leadership firsthand, but also reacting to the increasing number of visitors who come with less awareness of Sir Winston's place in history. We need to change that in order that they be moved, informed and inspired during their visits to Chartwell. We are also undertaking considerable research into the collection at Chartwell. For example, the Visitor's Book, which has been acquired as part of that fundraising project I mentioned, has within it almost 2,500 signatures, of which 132 were deemed indecipherable. Since starting this research project, we have been able to identify 80 of those, which is a wonderful, wonderful achievement, and in that list, are artists, industrialists, military leaders, political figures. So we are getting more and more knowledge about this incredibly special place and what life was like for Churchill living there. And this, I should say, is just one of a number of research projects being led by myself and my team. Other elements include a new family-friendly guide of the house, audio guides to the garden, we built a tree house, which is inspired by the one that Sir Winston built for his own children in 1923. And new exhibitions are just a handful of the innovative and exciting ways we are going to promulgate Churchill's legacy for our visitors. Lastly, we're not resting on our laurels and we are taking the stories of Chartwell beyond its walls, working with local residents, schools and community groups to share Churchill's legacy. From enhancing our public speaking competition, creating a whole new learning and education program, and sharing more digital content about Chartwell's history to allow for remote access and much more. And that's all on top of welcoming the quarter of a million visitors we see through our doors every year. Beyond our doors, we're also working with museums, galleries, and libraries around the world to share Chartwell's collections with an international audience. Coming up in the US alone, we have the Folger Library exhibition, Churchill Shakespeare, which we've supported, but also the Morgan Library, the National Portrait Gallery, and we are in talks with the FDR Library and Museum to contribute to their exhibition on D-Day next year. We at Chartwell are working tirelessly to ensure that Sir Winston Churchill's home, which houses a history of international importance, is at the forefront of safeguarding Churchill's legacy in an ever-changing world and doing our part to secure his place in history for future generations. Now, I should add that those elements of the project I've mentioned are being undertaken between now and 2020, and we are still fundraising to ensure that all of that activity and much more can take place. So if any of you do have any questions about what's going on at Chartwell, please do come find me, and I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Ladies and gentlemen, we, are, we will now take a 10-minute break before we begin the afternoon session. <laughs>